Okay, I've got, oh, okay. I've got a lot of content. Um, if you want to talk to me, I'm at Rhyolite on Twitter. I'll answer questions there. If you're on the Slack channel, I created a room called HTM. If you ask any questions there, uh, I'll come back around afterwards and answer them. Um, I'm a community manager, manager at Nementa. All of our code is open source, so I manage the open source community. Okay, my agenda. Why weak AI is not intelligent. I'm gonna talk a lot about cortical anatomy, the power of the pyramidal neuron, which is crucial to our theory, and we're gonna talk about layers and columns, as those are structures within the cortex, and then I'm going to do a, a very deep and quick dive on the entire HTM theory, our, our theory of how intelligence works in the cortex, even sensory motor stuff. All right, <laughs> I've already talked to you about this. I don't think weak AI will produce intelligence for the reasons that I've sort of told you, but I'm gonna tell you explicitly why and what's missing. So there's, <clears throat> there's two things. Um, one is realistic neurons. I, I mentioned that the point neuron that's used in, in, in machine learning systems today, it's too simple. Um, so I'm gonna tell you what we need to, to model in this neuron. And the other thing, which may not be uh, immediately evident to you, is that for an intelligent system to exist, it has to be able to move. Someone name anything that is intelligent that does not move. What? <laughs> I don't wanna repeat, I don't even know what it was. Okay, okay you can't. There is nothing that is intelligent that does not move. And the reason is, we have to be able to explore our environment. We have to, the, the way we understand reality, the way we understand the world, is by testing it, is by interacting with it, is by doing something, is by taking an action that changes something in the world. That's how we differentiate ourselves from our environment. We have to know who we are versus what our environment is. When we move this thing, what happens? When we get a different stimulus. When I move over here, my whole perspective of the world changes. You don't really think about that, but I have a completely different picture when I move here than when I move here, and my brain's just seamlessly integrating it all together. So movement is really important, and I'm gonna talk about that. So let's talk about brains. We're gonna do a little deep dive into the cortex. I'm gonna talk about the neocortex, which is the wrinkly stuff. The old brain will just drop out. If you spread this out, it looks like a sheet. It looks like it's about the size and, and proportion of a dinner napkin. And you'll see these structures. This is a homogenous structure, the neocortex. It's the same throughout. And at its core is this little cortical processing unit that we call a cortical column. And so I'm gonna talk about this. Now we've known that in the cortex there are layers for over 100 years. Um, this is Cajal, he's a famous neuroscientist who did all these drawings of the cortex back in the late 1800s and he's, uh, they're still used in textbooks today. So he, we found these layers a long time ago. We knew they, they existed. But this idea of a column in addition to the layer, sort of creating this like kind of structure, uh, a, a, a logical structure is sort of new. Because you can't look at the cortex and see the columns but we have the technology now to see them, that they're there. We can see by, because of the cellular structure uh, that these structures do exist. So I'm gonna talk about these layers and columns. So columns contain layers and layers contain neurons. So this is just a drawing of a layer I did. Th these layers are roughly cylindrical. I mean, this is all sort of abstract, but, um, but it's definitely true that layers contain neurons, columns contain layers, and the pyramidal neuron is an amazing computation engine. This is really the atomic computing unit in, in our model is the pyramidal neuron. And in, in any, I think today, even an ANN system, it's the primary compute model. But there's something that we need in this model that we don't have today. So we do have an inactive state and an active state. I mean, this is important. What the, what the neuron does is it, it activates, like it turns on, it, it spikes. Um, but we need another one, we need a predictive state. And, and this turns out to be really important. We, a neuron needs to know, yes I'm active or no I'm not, but I think I might be. I think I might be active soon. That's, that's an important prospect, because that's what your brain is constantly doing. It's constantly making predictions about what it's going to see next. Now in addition to these different states, the neuron also has different integration zones. So um, a little neuroscience lesson. There's three different types of 
uh, uh, dendritic segments that a, a neuron can have. Proximal, which is feed-forward input, that's like direct input, usually from in the direction of the sensory organs, so some senses are coming up and we're, we're processing that primary input. And then we have distal. This is sort of a lateral input um, from basal dendrites. And this is a contextual information that is used to modulate that proximal signal. Apical feedback is generally coming from layers that are, that are higher up in the column or other parts of the cortex, in, in, like the higher up in the, the entire hierarchy of intelligence. I'm not even gonna talk about hierarchy today. But. Um, so these three things are really important. It's not just one signal. It's like the neuron is looking at all three of these different zones and deciding am I active or not, am I predictive or not. That's, what it, that's its job. Um, so I told you that layers contain neurons, right? So it follows that if our neurons have these integration zones and they're all oriented in the same fashion, layers themselves will also have these integration zones. This lets us treat this as sort of its own little compute module. So these layers also compute. A layer can have 100,000 neurons in it. And, but typically, all of the distal input to that layer to those neurons will come from a common place. All of the proximal input will come from a common place. It, sometimes they're split, it depends, but the, the point is the layer doesn't know where it's getting its input from. It does the same thing. So and that's across all your brain. These, if you're processing visual input, uh, somatic input, which is touch, um, auditory input, the cortical columns that are processing that sensory data are doing the same exact thing, uh, the same process. And it's all about these, these layers in the columns. So like I said, proximal input is, is usually a driver signal, and these are modulatory signals. I'm going to show you some, these aren't simulations, they're just visualizations of these systems running. Um, so, and it sort of looks like this, it's like a cube. This is the equivalent of a layer in software. So when you see this, think of a layer. It's a bunch of neurons. Um, I'm not very good at animating, so they're cubes. But, um, so you're gonna see this later. I just want you to know that's, that is a layer. Um, and each one of those cubes represents a pyramidal neuron and their color represents what state it is in. Okay, I have to talk to you about sparse distributed representations. And this, this, it's really hard to change to this, but imagine a neuron, just one neuron. It might have thousands and thousands of dendrites, like uh, of, of potential connections to other neurons, right? That, and, and it's always looking at those connections and it's always seeing what's active, what's not, and deciding, am I next? Am I active? Am I next? Am I active? All the time. If you were to take all those dendrites and kind of wrap them up into a, a fiber, you know, like a fiber optics cable. I, I like to think of it as a fiber optics cable. And then you look at the, the end of it, you know, that's an SDR, a, a sparse distributed representation. In your brain, only 2% of your neurons are active at any point in time. Each one of those neurons that's active represents something semantically, or more than one thing, could represent many things. Um, it turns out this format, the sparsity and the distribution of it are really, really important to how your brain computes. Um, it, and each one of those bits has to have some semantic meaning. So if you're a neuron and you're deciding whether to fire or not, you're constantly looking at this long bit array, right? All an SDR is is an array of bits. It's really simple but only 2% of them are gonna be on at any time. Based upon which ones are on, I'm, it's gonna help me decide as a neuron whether I fire or not. Now I'm gonna be looking at my proximal SDR coming from below, and I'm gonna be looking at distal SDRs and potentially apical SDRs, all to decide whether I'm gonna fire or not. Um, I'm gonna show you some of the properties of SDRs really quickly, because I can. Um, just to give you an impression, of what an SDR looks like. That's not a very good one. Uh, well, you can't see the whole thing, but this is like a 256-bit SDR. It's at 2% sparsity with uh, you know, dub five bits on. And the capacity of this, in this particular SDR, 256 bits with five bits on, there are 8.8 .8 billion ways to arrange these five bits in this space, which is pretty large. But um, we typically use SDRs that are like this big. And 
we turn like 40 bits on. So the capacity is much, much larger. Uh, I, I don't even, <laughs> it's more than there are atoms in the observable universe. The point is you'll never run out of space here. In, in this, if you think about this as a fiber optics cable and you've got a signal coming across that cable, you can represent anything in it, like forever. So that, I mean, if that's not amazing. Okay. Um, <laughs> one other thing, I'm, I'm gonna do a quick, this is a really important property of SDRs too. On the left, I've got one random SDR. In the middle here, I have another random SDR. On the right here, I have their overlap, which is all the bits that they both share. Seems really simple, really, really important, because this is a similarity score. This is how close these SDRs are. And another important one is the union. So if this contains some semantics, some description about some state somewhere, and this also does too, then this contains the, both of those semantics. And the, the previous one contains the semantics that they both share. And, and this is really important because as a neuron, if you're constantly scanning all of your, your, your distal dendrites, looking at, at all the neurons that are on or not, you wanna know if you've seen that pattern before. So it's really nice to have this property to compare, oh, have I seen this SDR? Have I seen this SDR before? It's, it's, it's easy to uh, do that. Yes, uh, okay. So the question was, what does a predictive state mean biochemically? Um, in the neuroscience, the neuroscience terminology is a depolarized neuron. Um, and it has something to do with ion channels, and I don't know, I'm not a neuroscientist. <laughs> but look up depolarized uh, pyramidal neurons, and that is basically what we say is a predictive state. Uh, okay, back to the slide for a moment. Talked about SDRs. Okay, let's talk about encoders real quick. Encoders um, in, in biology are your senses. Uh, so think about your retina or your ear or whatever. Um, your optic nerve, for example, looks just like that fiber optics cable that I showed you, and your retina is doing a ton of work to produce a semantic representation of what you're seeing and pipe it into your brain. Um, we don't study senses, uh, my company doesn't, so all of our encoders are really stupid, really simple. Not say stupid, they're simple. <laughs> Um, but replicating the retina and the cochlea is extremely hard, and um, we're, we're working on the cortex, not the other things. So, um, so our encoders, but, but the fact is, in order to test these theories, we have to have semantic representations to push into the system and, and try and get it to understand the patterns in those. So we've done that somewhat artificially, or not artificially, non-biologically. So these examples of encoders, I'm just gonna show you one example like this date encoder, this doesn't even exist in your brain. Like we just made this up. Imagine you had a watch in your, in your brain that constantly told you exactly what time it was, what part of the season it was, what, what time of day it was, you just always knew exactly what time it was. That's sort of what this is, is like. So an example of this, uh, I am taking a date, here's today, here's tomorrow, and I'm encoding four dimensions of semantics I'm encoding what day of week it is, the weekend, the time of day, and the season. And you'll note that I'm not labeling anything. I'm just setting a, a section of bits in the representation to represent that semantically. So as I go forward in time, the day of week cycles periodically through its space. The weekend cycles. The time of day I haven't touched yet, but you can see the season is also slowly, periodically moving as I move forward in time. And if I do touch the time, you can see the time of day also moving. Down here is the whole encoding for this timestamp. We can simply take all of those sub-encodings and just concatenate them together, and we're done. So this represents the date. This is a way to, to encode semantically a date. And we also have, um, well, I'll, I'll show you this input space. Um, this sort of introduces the idea of, um, because we can, we can encode a bunch of different disparate data and, and put them all in one SDR and then pass it into the system, we typically call that the input space for the system. So uh, for example, here's some graph data. This is just 
power consumption at a building or something. So you can see there's obvious temporal patterns in it. And uh, let me make this smaller. Uh, as I go you know, through the days, you'll see these, the power value, which is this, this bucket right here, is, is cycling a lot because that's, that's the main value that I, that I want to encode here. The rest of it is just time of week and weekend. The, those other two values down at the bottom, and you'll see the, the weekend one go from one to the other. So we're encoding not only a scalar value, but a, at what time it was recorded. So there's automatically an association there. Yes, you had a question. Uh, yeah, you could do that. Um, the thing is, it, if you make it bigger, it's weighted differently. So it, it depends. Uh, like I, I wanted to weight all those generally the same. But how big you make the range for your, for your encoding, if you're going to concatenate it all together with a bunch of other encodings, it affects the, the weighting is, is important. Yeah, yeah, it's all about how big should we make these. And yeah, it's about the uh, importance of the feature. So you, so you can sort of see that this is what an input space, and again, imagine the fiber optics cable that you're looking at. This is sort of how it may be lighting up over time. This could be an input to your brain. But this is totally, you know, we made this up. Right, like I could take a, a completely different encoding mechanism. So I changed the scalar encoding mechanism to one that kind of randomly distributes that bucket instead of keeping it uh, a, a continuous bucket. It does the same exact thing. So you can imagine there may be thousands of ways you might be able to semantically encode this specific data in, into the, the system so they can understand it. This is just one way. Okay. So that's encoders. Um, all right, so here's where it gets deep. <laughs> um, <clears throat> spatial pooling. In the brain, in one of those layers, in some of those layers in, in the brain, we have these little structures called mini columns. And what a mini column is, is a grouping of neurons. You actually see them here. Um, it's, it's when neurons group together and share proximal input. Um, and this happens everywhere in your brain, in, in, in every one of these cortical columns. Some of the layers are doing this type of operation. And what it's actually doing, the point of it, is to take that spatial input uh, that we just saw, like that input space, and redistribute it so that we have control over that representation. And, and you'll, I think you'll see why in a minute. Um, but we do that by creating these mini column structures and saying every cell in this column is going to share its proximal input. Um, and this is all about feed-forward proximal input. And it, but it also has to maintain the semantic similarity of the input. Uh, I, I have to show you this for it to make any sense. Okay. Got a lot of demos. Um, overlap, connect to synapses. Okay. So you remember when I showed you that layer in software, I called it, and it was like this big three-dimensional grid. Imagine that this is, is that grid seen from the top, okay? So each one of these boxes is actually a column of neurons, not just one neuron. So these are, we would call these mini columns. Um, and they all, and here's, a, here's an example input space. Whoa, don't pay attention to that. Um, so this would be just some random input that would come in this input space. Each one of these columns has a specific relationship to that input space. So what I'm showing here is that column's potential pool of connections that it might make to the input space, proximal connections. Um, every one of these columns has a different potential pool. They're just randomly initialized. We're, we're trying to set, up, uh, uh, set it up like the brain, you know, because every neuron is not able to connect to every other neuron, or else we just make it all of them connect to all of them. And there's a reason for that. I don't, I'm not going to get into it. But every one of these has a different relationship with the space. Um, when we create this, this state, called, we call it a spatial pooler, but it's really just sort of a spatial pooling operation that we're running. E we also set up each one of these columns to have random initial uh, connections with the input. So it can be immediately stimulated, OK? Each one of these connections um, can only exist in its proximal, uh, in its uh, potential pool, excuse me. There will never be a connection in the white areas. And also, each one of these connections has a permanence value associated with it. So th some of your deep learning guys might, uh, uh, might find this familiar because it's basically um, Hebbian learning. We're, we're taking 
Is that the right term? Yeah. Uh, we're taking, so e, uh, like for that one that I highlighted, here's its, here's its permanence. It's like 0.6 something. Its connection threshold is 0.1, so it's connected. Um, all of them initially are different. This one's a little different. That one's a little different. You can see the chart on the side. The red ones are not connected. They're too low. So those started off as not being connected. This is sort of the initial state of the pooler. Well, let me show you how it learns. Okay, same setup for this visualization with a little bit of a difference. Um, all right, so we have a, a, a real input coming in here. It looks familiar, right, from the one I showed you earlier. So the, all these buckets, they actually mean something. And here is an example of one of those columns. It didn't activate, it didn't become active. The whole point of the spatial pooler is to turn these activations into these activations and retain the semantic meaning of the input space, but, but allow us to normalize how many bits are on. So that bit that I checked is not active. These green boxes are places where it had connections that overlapped with the input space. So we're doing an SDR comparison here, right? We're saying, how many of your connections overlap with this input space? It's the green ones do. That was apparently not enough for it to become active. This one, however, had enough of these connections overlapping with its input space uh, to become active. So what we'll do is we'll do this calculation for every column in the structure. How much do you overlap with, the, do your connections overlap with this input space? And if they overlap enough, we'll, we'll typically stack rank all of those columns and then cut them off somewhere. That's sort of what I try to show over there. All of those above, I don't know, 44 or somewhere in there. Um, um, we're gonna turn those columns on. By turning those columns on, they, in, they inhibit their neighbors from turning on. You know, by doing this sort of stack ranking, this competition. Um, and this now represents the semantics of that. And the last step is, if, if these columns win, their proximal connections to these, uh, these bits in the input space that were correct, those get increased, those permanence values get increased. So it, it reinforces, I recognize that spatial pattern, that specific spatial pattern, I'm gonna see it again, and I'm gonna recognize it again. For all of the ones where the connections did not uh, overlap with that space in the active columns, then we'll decrement them. So if we played this for a long time, and it was learning real patterns, and we went and inspected that, that column again, we might see that there's many less connections in the parts of the space where it hasn't gained an affinity to, like it, has, it hasn't started connecting to. So that's actually spatial pooling. So, so what we end up with, and this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do more animations here. Okay, so as you sort of understand, hopefully, that these, these, uh, column, these mini columns all represent some proximal, some proximal connection to an input space, they get activated, if the connections they're connected to uh, are, are active, and then once those columns are activated, then we're gonna choose what cells within the columns become activated, and that's the next step. So I just showed you this is all proximal input that we've talked about with the spatial pooler, but there's other stuff going on here. There's distal connections happening between the neurons in the layer, in, just in this one layer. So we're getting our distal context from the same layer. So the, the neurons in this layer are sort of looping back to themselves and giving themselves context. And what do you do when the only context you have is yourself? Your context is essentially your past, the states that you have been in in the past. So that's what we call this uh, temporal memory algorithm. Um, so it identifies the context of each input that we get um, based upon the state of the distal dendrites, or the distal connections that the pyramidal neuron has. Um, and uh, it works entirely within the structure of many columns that we've just activated. Um, and it will put the cells into a predictive state if necessary. So I have to show you an animation of this. This is by far my coolest animation, okay. Bear with me, I have to set this up. So this is gonna be a sequencer, just a little stupid note sequencer. You see this okay? Okay, you hear the notes. 
So, so this is the input space. Each note is being encoded in a different block of cells. This one is a rest, and it's not used. The spatial pooler is activating columns over here. And I can show this a little better if I spread them out. So you see the columns, right? So this is spatial pooling happening right now. And I'm going to show you how cells within those active columns become active and become predictive. <clears throat> so let's stop this right here. So let's show the active cells. Can you guys see this OK in the back? I know it's kind of, OK. Um, so now I'm showing you active cells. You can dive right in here. Uh, this is E. So these are the active cells for an E. And on, I mean, I haven't told you this before, but these cells represent E. Uh, it's learned it enough times that they've, they, they do, at this point, represent E. These active cells represent A. But when we loop around to the first one, look what just happened. What's up with that? <laughs> OK. The, the thing is, I'm sending the sequence in, and I'm not looping it. I'm not doing like over and over and over and over. I'm sending four notes in and then I'm resetting. I'm sending four notes in and then I'm resetting. I'm trying to train the sequence, but I don't want to train it on some endless infinite loop of things or else it'll just think, how long does this ever go on, you know? If you imagine, it, it's hard to temporally cut off a sequence that is, contains loops. So we're just going to cut it off manually. Run it, cut it off, run it, cut it off. So every time it sees an A, it sees it out of context every time because it never follows anything. If we see a C sharp, it knows, oh, C sharp follows A, so I know these exact bits are going to turn on. So that leads to my point. There are two ways that a neuron within a mini column will become active. There's two ways. The first one is if, is if there are any neurons that are already in a predictive state. If we have a column activate, and we look through it, and we say, oh, there's a, there's a neuron that's in a predictive state, you win. You were right. I mean, that neuron was correct. Because in the last time step, it thought, I, I think I'm going to be predictive. I think I've seen this before. I'm going to go into a predictive state. So when we get to the next one, we'll activate it. But that's not happening here, because we've, we've never seen A come after anything. We have no context. So if we have no context, if we get an unrecognized input, and there are no predictive cells here, we are going to activate every cell, every cell in the column, because we don't know. We're confused. It could be anything. And what will happen is, over time, uh, uh, we'll pick a cell to represent that new sequence, and it will represent it going forward. So now you're probably wondering, great, but um, how do we put a cell into a predictive state? So I told you the two ways it could be active. Um, if there is a predictive cell in the column, it activates. If there's no predictive cells in the column, they all activate. We call this bursting, by the way. I think that's a neuroscience term. <laughs> um, but how do they become predictive? So how we decide whether something is going to become predictive or not is we'll go through, uh, based on some input, we'll have to go through every single cell in the column. I'm just going to show you which ones are currently predicted. At, this, at C sharp, for example, uh, we're predicting that these cells are going to come next. These are the cells for E, because we've seen this you know, 10, 20 times so far. The reason that those become predictive is because they have these distal connections that have already grown because I've been playing this over and over and over, right? Um, this becomes predictive because uh, we've already done the transition A to C sharp over and over and over. So every time we've done that, we've grown segments and, and reinforced uh, learning from, from this C sharp or this prediction of E to the previous state, which was C sharp. And if I look at some of these, other, these others that aren't predictive, that's because they have no segments. They have no connections. Um, so if I were to move one time step forward, you should see all of these blue cells turn orange. Right. So we correctly predicted E. <laughs> so let me show you something interesting. I'm going to turn this off, and I'm, I'm going to let this play a little. I'm, I'm going to show you how bursting 
really, really works, how we really learn a new sequence. So I've learned this pretty well, A, C sharp, E, A. What if I stop it? Let's stop it right here at C. And these predictive cells, what are they predicting? E. I'm going to change that. Let's, let's make it F. We haven't seen an F before. So when I scoot this forward, let's turn on our active cells. Okay. So at, we're at the state right now where we're, we're at C sharp. All these on active cells represent C sharp. We're predicting these cells, which are the cells for E. When we move forward, we're not going to get those cells. Does anyone know what's going to happen? So, what was that? All the new, all the new columns, because we're going to have a new spatial input, something that we've never seen before. We haven't even shown F to this system yet. So we're going to have a new spatial input. Here it is. And almost all of them burst. What this is doing is, so we've seen A, C sharp, E before. And now we're seeing A, C sharp, F sharp. Never seen that. So the system's like, whoa, everything bursts. So we get this spatial input that's new, except for this one, because it must apparently share uh, a, some semantics with uh, E. But for the most part, everything bursts. And we're like, this is a new sequence. Um, so at this point, I'm just going to play this forward. So we're going to see these columns burst for a while until it gets the rhythm of the new sequence. And then it will eventually stop bursting and realize, OK, well, this is normal, right? This is normal. I've seen this sequence before. I've seen A, C sharp, E, and A, C sharp, F sharp. So it has stopped bursting except for that very first A. OK, I'm back at C sharp. I'm going to show you all the predictive cells now. Does it look like there's about twice as many predictive cells? Why is that? It's predicting both. It's predicting E and it's predicting F sharp because it's seen both of them. Now, if I were to play this on and on and on and over and over, eventually it'll forget that it ever had a C sharp to E transition and it will just have the pattern C sharp to F sharp. Um, all, of these are all of these things are tunable. So you can make a system that forgets really fast or remembers forever or whatever. Uh, so hopefully you get the gist. This is sequence memory. This is how, it's a really simple example, okay? This, this size of the structure is, is, is smaller than we usually use. I just can't visualize the size of structures that we typically build these systems with. Where am I at? Okay, I'm running out of time. Uh, okay, so you might be wondering, because I said, what am I supposed to, do I have seven minutes left? Uh, okay. <laughs> you might be wondering, hey, you said that the distal signal came from somewhere else, but in this example, um, we, we, had, we had all the input coming proximally, but we were feeding the distal input back into ourselves. We weren't getting it from somewhere else, from some other layer, or some other part of the cortex. Like I said, that's what provides the temporal context for the layer, because you're using yourself as, as your context, as your reference. That's how that works. Now, what if, and I don't have much time to go over this, but what if we change this a bunch, and we said, okay, we're gonna have that proximal input be a sensory feature that some sensor has felt on some object. And we're gonna have the distal input be the allocentric location of that object. So if you think about an object, you can think about a coffee cup, for example, anywhere in the world, any, anywhere, I could think about it there, I could think about it there, I could, I could place it wherever I want. You have an allocentric representation of that object, I mean it's self-contained. It doesn't require any other coordinate framework. It just exists, a coffee cup, right? So that's what I mean by allocentric. And I'm gonna give you another demo of this, which is in PowerPoint. I didn't make this one, somebody else did, but it was so good, I just wanted to do it. So here we're talking about a single column of uh, a single cortical column with two layers. So this is sort of our newer research stuff coming out of our company. Um, so we've identified this cortical circuit that we've seen exists. It exists in layer four and layer two, three of the cortex, where layer four has many columns and it receives input. Um, and we're gonna send the distal input in as the allocentric location on an object that we're about to touch. When we touch that object, we get sensory information that comes in as proximal input. 
the, we make a prediction, which is what the location is, uh, based on all the things we've ever touched on, on that part of an object before. Um, and if we're correct, then that's what represents this feature at a location on an object. That get, gets passed up to another layer. Okay, and, this, and, I, and I can't go into the details, I just don't have time. But this other layer now, it's, it's getting proximal input from that layer below it that's sending in sensory location features. And it's gonna decide based on that sensory feature at that location, these are the neurons that have, uh, that have represented that before, and these actually represent objects. So in this case, it's ambiguous. If we touch this point on this object, well, that feels like a cup and a can and a ball. But if we touch it again, we do the same thing. This is a different feature. Um, it's not smooth, it's kind of the rim. And then we pass it up, then we can take the ball right out. Um, because, and this is all those union properties I'm talking about SDRs, these are all SDRs. So we can now identify, okay, it's not a ball after the second touch, let's touch it again. Here's another unique feature at a location and I can now rule out the can, so I know now this is a coffee cup. These bits, these on bits, in that output layer represent an object in your brain, or in the brain of the software. And we can go even further with this, with multiple columns, and this is the cool thing. If, if we have, imagine that each column represents a finger. It doesn't really work like this in the brain. You've got lots of columns, you know, working with just one finger pad. But imagine that you had three columns and each was a, represented a finger. It's really useful if this finger can inform this finger, right? If you're touching something and they're both touching, they, they are doing that. Your, your brain, because these columns are sharing information, when you touch something, you get, you get feedback from this finger that helps this finger understand what you're touching. So what happens here is as we simultaneously touch this object and they all get different locations with different features from these fingers, the same thing happens and then in the output columns, one of, they're all ambiguous, right? But one's more ambiguous than the other because it's like, well, this feels like this, this, or this, and the other's like, it's definitely not a ball. Well, in your brain, these columns are informing each other. And if two of the three columns are like, it's not a ball, why not share that information with your other finger that thinks it might be a ball? And it can actually feed back and, and inform that, the, the column that's associated with that sensory input, that that's not a ball, and update its representation. The same thing if we do yet another grasp with different features, all feeding up into the object recognition column. Th this output layer is really doing a temporal pooling operation. Um, it has a library of all the objects it's ever learned, and it's just narrowing down narrowing down. Every time you touch something, it's like, well, it's not that, it's not that, it's not that, that's what it is. And when we've got lots of columns working together, all sharing what they think that object is that you're touching, then it can be much, much faster. It can identify the objects much faster. Do we do one more touch? No, that's it. Okay. And I, am t I have two minutes, so let me go through these last bit of slides. Like I said, on the Slack channel, there's HTM is one of the rooms. You can ask me questions there, and I'll be uh, around today. Um, all of our code is open source. Um, we've got our research code, our core code, et cetera. Um, I'm the open source community manager, so if you deal with any of the stuff you're dealing with me, I'm, I'm happy to help. And other thing is all of our research papers are uh, accessible. We try to make everything as transparent as, and accessible as possible. And I have a YouTube channel. Um, so I do Everything I've shown you is on this YouTube channel. I, I have this whole lesson called HTM School that goes through everything from bit arrays to temporal memory sequences um, uh, from the ground up. And I'm working on some of the sensory motor stuff that I just talked about. There will be more episodes about that coming soon. Um, so if you're interested in this, please check us out, nementa.org. Um, I'm Ryle Light at Twitter and GitHub, and you can follow my company, Nementa, also. I think that's it. Yeah. So I'm happy to take questions in the very limited time that I have. Yes. Yeah, that's that's where. We're, well, okay. Our goal is to try and understand how intelligence works. This just happens to be something that we can see and we can we can postulate. We think that this is how object recognition works, and it's not just your fingers, right? It's your eyes. It's your ears. It, when you think of a coffee cup, you're not just thinking about how it feels, you're thinking about what it looks like. 
So all of those sense, all that sensory input contributes to your representation of objects that you know in the world. So the existence of a coffee cup exists everywhere in your brain all at once. And, and because, well, I wouldn't say everywhere, but lots of places in your brain, the places that process your somatic senses, your visual, your auditory, well, you can't really hear coffee cups, but you know. <laughs> No, uh, no. So the question was, if, if you get impaired, if you have a brain injury or something, and, and oh, if your sensory input is impaired. Um, so what generally happens if you're blind or something happens to your senses is uh, your brain is very plastic, so it'll reroute. It'll, it'll take your auditory input and pipe it into the parts of your brain that's not getting any input. And you'll see that. With, I mean, there's a reason why um, blind people have uh, enhanced senses in other areas. It's because their brain's still working at 100%. <laughs> yes? They're great. Uh, neomorphic computing chips. Um, okay, just a note about hardware. There's nothing in hardware right now that can, that can run this stuff uh, really naturally and fast. Like, we run it, obviously, on CPUs. We can run it on GPUs. But it's not, we're not going to take advantage of this architecture until we have hardware that, ha that is plastic, until we, have little compute, until we can represent neurons that can grow and, and degrade connections to each other. Uh, we're, we're not going to be able to do this in hardware. There's a lot of stuff we can do with software, but... Uh, but there's definitely more than one organiza big organization working on that type of uh, plastic hardware. Anything else? Any other questions? Yes, in the middle. The biggest limitation of the current deep learning models. Um, well, uh, you know the thing about um, integrating all of those things to to go after a common goal. I think that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I think deep learning can do some really great n narrow things like the facial recognition and, and voice recognition and all that stuff. But putting it together into a package that understands human humans, uh, that, can understand, that understands intelligence, I mean, that you can, you know, communicate with is really hard. Uh, by the way, who thinks Alexa is, is intelligent? All right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everybody, for coming to my talk. really appreciate it.